all those around you, if you would, and welcome our visitors here as we worship together. Campbell to present our quilts of honor. Well, good morning. 
and welcome to our fourth presentation of Quilts of Valor for the veterans of First Baptist Church that are members here. We uh, have heard the story several times about how the Quilt of Valor Foundation was organized, so I'm not going to tell you how to do that again. You can just go on the website and look at it. We know that it started when a mother of a young soldier had a dream about her son. It's a good story. <clears throat> Today is Veterans Day, November the 11th. Did you know that it is always on November the 11th? Okay, some of you did. I did not. <laughs> but we're glad it's today on Sunday. And uh, in case you hadn't thought about it, this is the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I. This war only lasted four years. And so this day today at 11 o'clock, 11, 11, 11, will be the exact time that the war ended. All of our sewers this morning are wearing red poppies. These were actually made by some of our allies in the war. These were made by the Canadians. And they're always to be worn on the red, on the right side. Now, I didn't have a large red poppy, but I happen to have a white one, and maybe it's large enough that you can imagine it's red. The red, of course, represents for the ultimate sacrifice, the blood that was shed. The center is black, which represents the uh, soldiers that were lost. The leaf is always supposed to point at 11 o'clock, because that's when the war ended. The threads of blessing have been honored to make these quilts. We're very thankful for the sacrifice of all of our veterans, and we're proud to have presented 72 quilts in two years to the men of our church. If you can just... Thank you, it's been a labor of love. Um, if you can just imagine this morning, <clears throat> excuse me, all of those 72 men and women standing around the balcony holding their quilts, wouldn't that be a sight to see? Um, so I think we're ready to present our quilts today. So as I call your name, you, you know what you're supposed to do. I will tell you, I hope you do. <laughs> At the end of the service, if all of you would come out to the atrium, we'd like to take a group picture of you with your quilts. All right, the first veteran for today is Alex Bird, and he's not able to be here. Number two is Johnny Carlson. Next is Jimmy Kahn. Well, they've lost it. <laughs> It'll show up in a minute. I know we have one for you. Uh, Lois Dragemeyer. Just stay there. Steve Dragemeyer. Ryan Dufresne is next, and he has moved, so he's already received his quilt. Kenneth Phillip. Okay. We found it. You know, we have weak eyes because we've been sewing a lot. <laughs> Griff Griffin.
Michael Marburger is not here to Burger is not here today. Bob Perry. Can't imagine why his wife wanted to give that to him. Richard Ramon. Bonnie Sharp. Doug Slight. Charlie Smith, Rocky Stone, Robbie Trueblood, I don't believe is here today, Roland Williams, and Scott Michael Wilson. We thank you guys, for, and Bonnie and Lois, for your service. Amen. While, while you can be seated for just a moment, you guys stay up here for just a second too. Um, hey, and I know we got a chance to, to honor each one of these that got their quote. If you were, uh, if you are a veteran, if uh, we would love for you to stand at this moment because we'd like to, to, to honor each one of you. I know we have several over the time. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. you. May be seated. Now, you guys, you guys may be seated as, as well. We, we appreciate your service. We thank you for your service. We also thank those that are still serving uh, for our, our freedoms as well. Because guess what? If it weren't for these uh, men and women and the men and women that have served, that are continuing to serve, we would not be able to be here today. And we are so grateful uh, for each one of them and their, their sacrifices and the families of those that also serve in the sacrifices. Because guess what? Next, next we are actually transitioning into a time to dedicate our Operation Christmas Child boxes. And like I said, if, if, if it weren't for them, we would not be able to do this here in our sanctuary today. Yvonne, you can start making your way up. Um, earlier, a few weeks ago, um, Carol Ann Bonds gave me a book to read. And she was, she was kind enough to mark the good spots so I don't have to read the whole thing. I don't know. I guess she just thought I just either didn't like to read or don't have that much time to read. And there's a, she was, a, it was cool. This is a, it's an Operation Christmas Child book that has stories uh, from the boxes of, of people that have received them. Um, you can go online and on the Samaritan's Purse website and find great stories of what impact each one of these boxes uh, are making and have made. Um, but guess what? Today in the sanctuary today, we get to see a, an in-person person that has had received a box as a child. This is uh, Yvonne. Um, Yvonne was telling, uh, actually Martha was telling this story. I guess he told it to her. He was walking through the house. I hope this is okay that I share this, right? It's not going to hurt you or anything. Okay. He was walking through the house, I guess, uh, this past week or recently, and he saw a stuffed animal uh, there on the table or, or sitting there, and he picked it up. He goes, you know what? I received a stuffed animal like this in one of my boxes 
uh, when I was a child. Uh, and Martha put it so great yesterday when we were packing boxes with Adult 4 that, you know, as, as those that have helped with these boxes in our church, as we send them out, you know, these are each individual missionaries that we get to send out each year that get to share the love of Christ and share the gospel with the children that receive it. So we, we thank you. We, we thank each uh, department, each person that was, has been a part of this and continue. I hope those that have done boxes, I hope you have utilized the, the ability to track your box to see where it goes, because you can do that now thanks to the technology. Um, so we're going to take this time, and Yvonne's actually going to pray over these boxes. We thought, what a great, a great way to, to dedicate the boxes than, than someone who has received one himself. And after that, the, the choir will take over with their special song. So pray for us here, Yvonne. Let's pray. Señor y Padre nuestro, te damos gracias, Padre, por esta mañana. Gracias, Señor, por la vida que nos das. Gracias, Padre, por tu iglesia. Gracias, Señor, por aquellos que comparten tu evangelio en todo el mundo. Te ruego, Señor, en esta mañana que puedas bendecir estas pequeños, estos pequeños regalos que van a ir a cualquier parte del mundo, que van a traer esperanza para los niños que puedan recibirlo. Sobre todo, Padre, que puedan compartir tu palabra acerca de tu Hijo Jesucristo que un día murió por aquellos que creen en ti y por todo el mundo, Señor. Te ruego que pueda estos regalos ser bendición para cada familia, para cada niño, tocar los corazones de cada uno de ellos, Señor, y escuchar tu voz. Gracias, Señor, por las misiones, por el corazón de tus hijos que pueden compartir a través de esto, de este proyecto. Te ruego que puedas bendecir, que puedas bendecir desde ya, Señor, a todos aquellos que van y comparten tu palabra. Gracias, Padre. Te te rogamos y te lo pedimos, Señor, en el nombre de Cristo Jesús. Amén.
Brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your blessings thus far in this service. Thank you for the presentations that have been made, both with the quilts and the shoe boxes. Just bless them as they are sent to where they need to be going. And for those who served in our country today, as we celebrate Veterans Day, just be the rest of our service and let your blessings be upon it. For in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. We pray for blessings we pray for peace. 
comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity, and we pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. spoken need, yet love us way too much to give us lesser things, cause what if your blessings come through raindrops, what if your healing comes through tears, what if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know your name, and what if trials of this are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger when we cannot feel you near. We doubt your goodness. We doubt your love, as if every promise from your word is not enough. All the while, you hear each desperate plea, as long as we had faith to believe. Cause what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know your need? If the strides of the are your mercies in this night? When friends betray us, when darkness saves the pain reminds our heart, this is not, this is not our home. It's not our home. It's what if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your just say thank you again to the veterans uh, who have served, your families have served alongside you here in uh, wh wherever your home was, and I want to thank you. My, my father-in-law, uh, John Glass, was in the Army, and my dad was in the Army, and our youngest daughter works for the VA in Southwest Oregon helping homeless vets find home. So we have some connection there, and we thank you so much for what you do. Connie and I have been a part of many collections of Good Samaritan uh, boxes to be sent, but we have never had the experience of seeing them all here offered to God as well as to the people. This is, this is a wonderful way to offer our gifts to those people who are less fortunate than we are. I want to just do a little quick plug for 
our worship service over at the Baptist Memorial Center Chapel. In the evenings, we have service at 5 o'clock. And tonight, I happen to be speaking on the passive scripture that was used again in our offertory prayer, as in our offertory time, uh, Romans uh, 12, 1 and 2. And I hope that you'll think about joining us over there at 5. We're, we're done by 10 till 6, and you can get back and watch the football game and, and end the day well. I don't know, is Dallas playing? Oh, it's playing tonight, right? Tonight. I need to know to whom I'm speaking today. Who is, would you consider yourself a cowboy? Any, anybody a cowboy? All right, some of you 11 and 12 year olds are holding your hand up. All right, how many of you would consider yourself to be a horseman? Anyone? All right, today's passage of scripture and the title of the sermon is Run with the Horses and it's found in Jeremiah chapter 12, one to five. A tough old cowboy from South Texas counseled his grandson that if he wanted to live a long life, the secret was to sprinkle a pinch of gunpowder on his oatmeal every morning. <laughs> it gets better. The grandson did this religiously to the age of 103 and then he died. He left behind 14 children, 30 grandchildren, 45 great-grandchildren, 25 great-great-grandchildren, and a 15-foot crater where the crematorium used to be. <laughs> now that's a cowboy. Last week I referenced my father-in-law's funeral, um, and my pastor at the time was Cliff Harrington, who was from First Baptist Church in Conroe, and he and the whole staff came to that service. It was a meaningful time for us, but he made an observation as they walked into the funeral service and noticed that there were a lot of Western suits present. Gentlemen, he said, there are no drugstore cowboys here. My father-in-law was that kind of cowboy, but he was also a horseman. When he died in 1981, he had owned over, he owned over 70 horses, one of which was a champion quarter horse show animal. In fact, Mr. Meekwick won the Midland Association America, excuse me, the Midland America Quarter Horse Association Grand Champion. It was a gray stallion. He was an absolutely a beautiful horse. In his honor, uh, we went to the Houston Livestock Show to watch the final showing of this horse. My, my father-in-law died um, on the next to last showing of the horse, and we went to honor him. My father-in-law was a true horseman. I, on the other hand, am not. The title of the sermon, as I mentioned, Run with the Horses, based on Jeremiah 12, 1 to 5. My experience with horses is a little different than my father-in-law's experience with horses. When I was at Howard Payne, uh, when I first went to Howard Payne, I was on the campus revival team, <clears throat> and we would go out and lead weekend revivals in churches around the area. Uh, we, our team usually consisted of somebody who was a preacher, somebody who led the music, somebody who played the piano, and somebody who planned the fellowships and conducted those. So we went to a church over in Central Texas. It'll remain nameless at this point. Uh, because we were not having a good experience, a good revival experience, uh, through the first three services. So Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday morning were just not very good. On the Sunday, our preacher uh, spoke on, are you prepared? Being prepared for Christ's second coming, being prepared for the time when you and I stand before uh, God. And uh, that was kind of the atmosphere that we were talking about. And after the service, we were invited to go out to a ranch and to ride horses uh, with the, the teenage daughter and the, the person who owned the ranch, I made it clear from the beginning I was not going to participate. I was going to be an observer. So we're out there riding horses. Everybody's fine. And the daughter, who is on the back of a horse at the time, and she was a horseman. She uh, did do some showing, and she did some uh, barrel racing and that sort of thing. And so she rode her horse right up to the fence where I was just watching, and she said, 
why don't you just get on the back of this horse and we'll ride together. I protested for about uh, 10 seconds and then she said, just come on, get on the horse. So I did. I got on the horse and we were riding together. About five minutes into this, she turned back to me and said, you know what, I think you can ride this horse. And she promptly got off. <laughs> leaving me on the back of the saddle. Now, if you're a horseman, or if you know anything about horses, you know it's not a good idea to allow horses to run back to the barn. If you, if you have any inclination toward horsemanship, you know that that's not a good idea. This horse had been allowed to do that. The barn was up the hill. She got off. I'm in the back of the saddle. I did not have the reins. My feet were not in the stirrups, and that horse took off running at full speed. I'm terrified, just to be honest with you. I was terrified. And the preacher of the day said, Are you prepared? <laughs> that horse ran straight to the barn, up the hill. I, I think it was 150 miles an hour, but it was a fast up the hill and got to the barn and did a right angle turn just like that. Uh, I had gotten at least my foot in the stirrups and gotten one reins and I was thrown off that horse and into a barbed wire fence. Now if you look real closely, I've got scars, now this is 50, almost 50 years ago, I, I got scars here and all up and down my side from hitting that fence. Well, we spent the rest of the day in the emergency room at the hospital. So I left the hospital with a bandage over my eye and over my face. We had the best worship service we'd had all weekend. I'm not saying that the horse was responsible, but I am saying that God used that very difficult circumstance to speak to us in the way that we needed to be spoken. I learned that day that I could not run with the horses or ride them. Now I want you to look at the text. It's, he, it's Jeremiah chapter 12. I'm going to read the first five verses. And the outline is in the bulletin, by the way. Here's what Jeremiah says to God. You are always righteous, O Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak to you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You've, you've planted them and they have taken root till, to grow and bear fruit. You are always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Yet you know me, O Lord. You see me and test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land lie parts and the grass and every field be withered? Because those who live in it are wicked. The animals and birds have perished. Moreover, the people are saying he will not see what happens to us. And then verse 5. If you have raced with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with the horses? Truth of the matter is, here's the context of that sermon. The children of Israel were in constant rebellion against God. I, I'm sorry, but some of us sometimes are just in constant rebellion against God. Jeremiah's assignment was to preach repentance. He was to tell the people how wicked, evil, mean, and nasty they were and that they needed to repent. The people were not very responsive, even though he had preached this for many years. Jeremiah got very tired of this, and you saw in the first four verses that he complained a lot about it. Then God came to him with the words of verse 5, If you have raced with men on horses, and they have worn you out, if you have raced with men on foot, and that has worn you out, how can you compete with the horses? For Jeremiah and for us, this is a picture or a metaphor of deeper discipleship, a deeper relationship with the creator of the universe. 
The question to Jeremiah and to us is, are you going to go to the next level of discipleship? Are you going to plumb the depths of a relationship with the Lord? Are you going to go deeper with God in this relationship? So how can, how can we do that? How can we do that? How can we plumb the depths of a relationship with God? Here are four R's, and you see them in the bulletin, four R's that may help you in understanding and then doing this. The first one is relationship. Discipleship is about a deep relationship with the creator of the universe. Now, maybe you've gotten here today, and you have never accepted Christ as personal Lord and Savior. You've never invited him in to forgive you of your sins and to allow him to take over the management of your life, to be the boss of your life, to help you live the life to which he has called you. Maybe you've gotten there. But perhaps most of you are like me. I have friends, I have colleagues, I have family members who do not have that relationship with God. And maybe I can uh, uh, use this outline. You can use this outline. I've shared it with you before. I just want you to be reminded of it. If you want a relationship with God or if you want to help someone to have a relationship with God, here's what you need to do. Realize that you are a sinner. You and I are without hope. We, we cannot make it on our own. We cannot do enough good things to earn a right relationship with God. We have to realize we're a sinner. Romans 3.23, a verse with which you're very familiar. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not some, but all. Every single person in this room has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The second step you need to take is relate that to God. Relate that to God. The Bible word for relate is confess. It's not like God doesn't know these things. He knows that you and I are sinners. But he wants us to tell him that we've come to that realization. So in 1 John 1, 9, it says this. If we confess our sins, if we relate this to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The third step is to repent. Now you've all heard this. You've, you've heard sermons. You've heard Bible studies. Maybe you've even done these Bible studies where you say to someone, we need to repent. We need to repent from our sins. We're going in that direction and we need to repent to God. We need to turn to God uh, for forgiveness. Repent. Acts 3, 19 to 20, repent then and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Now guys, I've got some bad news for you. You can do those three things. You can realize that you're a sinner, you can tell God about it, and you can repent. I'm not going to smoke, drink, cuss, or chew, or go with the girls who do. You can do those three things and not have a relationship with God. I have a friend, Ricky Cabot, who's the youth minister almost at 30 years at uh, Coggan Avenue in Brownwood. He preached in chapel this week, and he used this phrase. We need to not only believe in Christ, we need to receive Christ. So you can do all those right things there at the beginning, but unless you receive him into your life, you're not a believer. You don't have a relationship uh, with God. John 1.12 says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to, to become children of God. So we do those four things there, and, and something later I'll tell you about. But we, we do those four things, and we can have the beginnings of a relationship with with God. Now, I want you to kind of let these things roll around your mind for just a minute. We all know what a king is. Everybody in this room knows what a king is. A king is the owner and ruler of everything. In our relationship with Christ, we have to decide if Christ is going to be the king of our lives. He owns us. He controls us. He leads us in the direction we need to go to become more and more like his son. Are we going to treat him as king or are we going to treat him as a hobby? 
I went to church this week. That's a check a box. I read my Bible three times this week. That's a check a box. Oh, and by the way, Chuck, I did share my faith with somebody at work. That's a check a box. That can be seen, God can be seen as a hobby if we're not totally sold out to Him. He is the King. There's no shortcut to discipleship, it's hard work. Two words ought to describe our discipleship relationship with God. And the first one is obvious, disciple. You've probably heard many times that a disciple is a willing learner. It's someone who's bought in. They, and the disciples in the New Testament case, they follow Jesus. They left their work, they left their families, and they followed Jesus for three years to learn about him, a willing learner. Nobody coerced them. Nobody twisted their arm. They decided that they would be a disciple, a willing learner. But the other part is pilgrim. I love this song that was just sung. We are on a journey to become like Christ. This world is not our home. It's amazing to me that we spend so much time and effort and energy trying to make this world a better place to live. And I'm not knocking that. What I'm saying is this world is not our home. We need to be laying up treasures in heaven. We are citizens of heaven. Now I don't mean, and you've heard me say this, I don't mean sitting around in a rocking chair and singing song. I mean that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. He is our king and we will be his servants, just as we are. We're beginning it here, but we're continuing there. If we're going to run with the horses, we must have a relationship with God. The second thing is reliance. Now, these are kind of obvious things. If we're going to uh, run with the horses, we're going to have to rely on God for our resources, for our help, for our well-being, for, uh, for him to prepare us to be ready to go and spend eternity with him. We're going to have to rely on him. It's all about grace and mercy. Grace is getting something I don't deserve, salvation, and mercy is not getting what I do deserve, eternal separation from God. God has given us this, but we have to rely on Him uh, for that to happen. If we're going to have a relationship with Him, we have got to rely on Him. The other one, though, may not be quite so obvious. We also have to rely on the gifts and abilities that He has given us. If you haven't heard this from me yet, you're going to hear it several times. We don't just go to church. We are the church. We are the church. When you show up at the post office, when you show up at a retail store, when you go to the gas station, we go to the cleaners, you go to some place of business, you go to school, wherever you are, when you walk in the door, you are the church. You are the body of Christ to the people with whom you'll come in contact that day. So we have to rely on the abilities and gifts and talents that he has given us. Look at Romans chapter 12 verse 6 to 8. You can look at it later. I'm just going to read it to you. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving let him serve. If it is teaching let him teach. If it is encouraging let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others let him give generously If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it's showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. God intends for us to rely on on these gifts that he has given us in order to make a difference in this community, in our families, and wherever we find ourselves. You've probably seen the poster out there that says we must give our children roots and wings. Have you seen that one? Roots and wings. In this context... The roots are our reliance on God. In Ephesians, Paul says, let your roots go down deeply into God. Let them go down deeply into the soil of God. But then the wings part is our reliance on the gifts and abilities that he gives us. We have to use what he has given us to be the church wherever we find ourselves. Do you not know? 
Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary in his understanding. No one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power to the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to 31. Rely on God, on our relationship with Him, and on the gifts and abilities He gives us. If we're going to run with the horses, we must have a relationship with God, and we must rely on God and His gifts to us. Third thing is relentlessness. Relentlessness. This means that we are to hang tough even when the going gets rough. You, you heard about it in the song. It's such a great song. We need to, to be with him, hanging tough when the going gets rough. One man put it this way. The essential thing in heaven and earth is that there should be an, a long obedience in the same direction. There should be a long obedience, long Obedience in the same direction. Relentlessness. Most of my ministry has been youth ministry. I've been doing ministry for 50 years. Um, I've, I've served in some capacity of youth ministry for nearly that entire time. <laughs> I've planned lots of camps. I've planned lots of retreats, disciple nows, Bible studies. Uh, conferences and training events and so on and so on and so on. I would not say that any of those was easy to organize and conduct. But I would say that compared to what it means to be a real follower of Christ, those things are pretty easy. They're pretty easy. It's the day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, nitty gritty of trying to get to know God intimately. A staff member with whom I served once said, Christianity is just so daily. You may remember this illustration. I shared it sometime while I've been here. Uh, a young lady who was 15 years old ran up to me at youth camp, and she almost shouted, Mr. Chuck, after one more week of quiet time each day, I will have spent time with God every day for a year. That is relentlessness. She turned 50 this past year, and she still continues to spend time with God every day trying to find out what his plan is for her life and what she ought to be doing with her life. Relentlessness. Jeremiah had the grim responsibility of preaching repentance to the children of Israel who did not respond. He complained and God said to him what is in our text today. So for 23 years, Jeremiah spent some part of his day with God. He was relentless. The good news for us is that he didn't on that first day say, I'm going to commit to spend 23 days every day, uh, 23 years every day with God in personal worship. What he did was he met God on the first day and made a commitment that he was going to meet him the next day and so on and so forth for 23 years. So what am I asking you to do? It's not a challenge I'm unwilling to accept, too. I'm asking you to commit to spend time with God tenaciously, relentlessly, committedly with Him every single day. But I'm asking you to start with tomorrow. And at the end of your time with God tomorrow, commit to tenaciously, relentlessly, committedly Spend time with God the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Relentlessness. What's going to happen is that gradually, subtly, sometimes faster than others, God's very life will be fused into your life, and you will become like Him. 
And it won't just be about good behavior. I think that in today's world, we spend a lot of time talking about being good. It's not just about being good. It's having the character of God. You'll be able to run with the horses. One last thing. The word is response. Response. To run with the horses, we must have an intimate relationship with God. We must rely on God and his gifts to us. And we must relentlessly pursue him but it all starts with a response are you going to run with the horses or are you going to settle for second best are you going to treat God as king or will you just treat him as a hobby the choice is ours let's pray Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that we've done in this worship service to try to honor you and honor people who honor you. We thank you that uh, there are people who um, give their time, energy, and effort to protecting us. We also thank you for the generosity of our church as we seek to help people who are less fortunate than we are. But more than anything, we thank you that you are investing yourself in our lives to help us to become more and more like you. So, Father, as we come to this time of invitation, I pray that you will help us to be willing to accept the challenge of running with the horses. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.